So good afternoon or well, what time it is, everybody. It's evening for me. It's five o'clock central time. Uh, this is Eric Hale with uh, Trader Oasis. And I'm very honored and pleased to say we've got another special guest to be with us today. We have uh, Dr. Ari Blitz. Say hello, Ari. Hey, Eric. Hey, Greg. Hi, everyone. Yeah, of course, Greg's here, too. Howdy, folks. I'm here. Yeah, I, I'm speak. excited for today's look. Uh, conversation as well. I'm in learning mode today, so I, I'm excited. I know the content we're going to talk about, and I, I'm very excited to learn something that I'm going to be honest. I'm a, I'm very naive about this. So it's a, it's a not you know it's a very complicated area even for the medical profession. So well, don't feel bad. <laughs> well, I'm excited. So what we're the topic of our presentation today is GLP one inhibitors. And it's something I've been fascinated. It's been getting a lot of attention and there's a lot of myths and realities that are out there. And um, Dr. Ari has extensive experience and he's going to bring it to us. But before that, I, this is this is happy NVIDIA earnings day. And as we sit, uh, NVIDIA is up $50 after hours uh, to um, about seven twenty five dollars right now. It's been a little higher, been a little lower. Um, so we were, I don't want to spend too much time talking about NVIDIA, but, but I did do a nice little trade that should make a nice little bit of money tomorrow. Uh, really high, uh, high return, very low probability, but it's kind of a pin the tail on the donkey. And I think I'm looking forward to that. So, do you know, speaking of that, I haven't, since we're talking NVIDIA, I have to throw out a, I actually need to look at my phone cause I took a snapshot of it. Someone tweeted this earlier today. There were a uh, volume to, at a volume surge today for NVIDIA call options that are expiring February 23rd. So this Friday, there were 17,000 contracts traded of the $1,300 strike. 1300 The $1,300 strike. That, They're that expecting by Friday, 100% move by Friday. By Friday that we could get NVIDIA 1300 I think we're going to go up tomorrow, but I don't know about 1300 by Friday. Yeah. So we, we closed around uh 674 and right now we're up, like I said, up $50. We were a little bit higher. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this trade turns out. Um, yeah. The so. casino Vegas has nothing on the, on the options market from that standpoint, <laughs> you can gamble all you want when it comes to short-term options. And we do have a show summit coming up in Las Vegas. Unfortunately, I don't think, Ari, you're probably not going to be able to make it, are you? Yeah, I'm not going to. But one of these days, I will definitely come. So, Ari, um, outside, but we're, I, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself and what you do. But I did want to highlight something very important that you and I both have in common, and that is that we both work with rescue. We volunteer our time with animal rescues. And how many dogs are at your house right now, Ari? Right now, we have five only. But, Only uh, five. Okay. It, it it can go up to twenty at times, depending on whether we have to deliver a mother and her babies. So I'm very personally very passionate about uh, rescue, and there's lots of good dogs that are available out there. So I encourage anybody that's considering a pet, and especially those that we we have a desperate need for fosters. There's more dogs than we we just took in six breeder mama golden retrievers or ex breeders. I think there might have been a male in there too. But we just took in six uh, over the weekend, and we're looking for foster homes. Why well, we have foster homes for, for them? But um, I think in the past month we've taken in 23 breeder rescues, and they're fantastic dogs. So. I would love to help out. I'm, I, I have five people that live in my household. Four of them are allergic to dogs. I'm the only one who's not. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I could probably go live somewhere else. <laughs> well, all right. Well, I want to make sure that we are respectful of uh, Ari's time. It's very uh, valuable. But why don't you sh just share a little bit about your professional background and, and maybe work your way up to what it is that you do now? Sure. So I finished my medical training in the late 1990s. I trained and practiced as a cardiac surgeon for about 25 years. Uh, unfortunately, I developed what's called a retinal detachment, which ended up my, ended my operating days. Uh, so since then, since I wasn't prepared to retire as of yet, I decided to focus on the specialty of obesity medicine. 
and got my board certification in that area as well. Well, that's fantastic. And you do most of your clinical work is um, via Zoom, isn't it? So you're very comfortable. Correct. Okay. Correct. It's all 100% telemedicine. So you see people all, all over the U.S.? Are they in a specific region? Yeah, they're scattered over the U.S. I have quite a few clinics I work with, uh, you know, that that uh, I have multiple state licenses, so it makes it easy. There are rules for it, and you have to not only be licensed in the state where you are, but also in the state where the patient's being seen. So it's a little bit tricky at times, but yes, all over. And the other passion that I know Ari has, uh, and that is outside of dogs and medicine, is is investing. And that's how we know each other. Ari uh, trades on Trader Oasis, and he's a client at Options Animal. And um, so he's very knowledgeable and, and or he, I, I would say, definitely qualified to talk about uh, companies uh, and stocks, because you've, you've shared some information, and I, I know you're picking this stuff up. So... He brings a really unique set of um, of qualifications, I think, to help us as traders better understand this market. And we've got a lot to talk about here. And I think any one of these topics, I sent you some list of topics that we're interested in. Um, but let's start at the beginning. Like, what's up with obesity, man? Like, it, it's it's um, we're all we're all getting fatter, aren't we? Yeah, the, the statistics are pretty bad. You know, the, the usual statistic that's thrown around is that 42% of adults in the United States are obese, but the more correct figure is about 75%, which includes the patients that are overweight. So the, this, the medical therapy, all the ones, the GLP ones that we're talking about are approved for anybody with a BMI ab above 27 which means, yeah, it's not. So uh, obesity starts usually at a BMI of 30. Right. So that category of patients with a BMI above 27 is about three quarters of the population. I heard a doctor speak one time about uh, weight, and this was a few years ago, and he was saying that your uh, girth, your diameter around your waist should be about half of your height. And that's not easy math for somebody to do. But if you want to do the test, take your belt off and your belt, the tip of your belt to where you buckle it should be about your waist height. And if you see that coming up a little bit higher, your girth is a little bit wider. So that's a different objective measurement. But do you have any thoughts as to why this is happening? Why are people, is it, is it, is it just something in the culture? Is there, is there some... Is it is it in the drinking water and what's going on? As as with any as you guys like to say at options animal, it depends. Depends. <laughs> but okay. there's a lot, of, there's a there's a lot of factors that that go into play. Uh, but one thing we definitely see is that it's it's going up and up and up. And there's a, a huge um, rate of obesity in children now. And so these medications are now being used. They're approved for children over the age of 12 because um, you know, as much as it's a stigma and an issue for adults, for kids, it's devastating. It's devastating. Right. So well, there's the, you know, there's the mental health aspect of this too, right? There's, you know, self-esteem and maybe depression associated, but there are real physical, I mean, osteoarthritis and joint disorders, diabetes, heart disease, some cancers are all uh, sleep apnea as well, all tied to um, obesity. I well, I didn't proof I didn't prep you on this one ahead of time, but do you think I mean is it high fructose corn syrup? Is it is it seed oils? Do you think any of that carries weight? I don't think so because I think that it, none of that has born or been borne out in the studies. Okay, but you know I think it's part cultural, uh, part uh, you know. We, kids are having less and less activity. They're spending more and more time on their iPhones. People have become much more sedentary, right? Now we're having Zoom conversations and sitting at a desk much more than I think in the past. And uh, it, it's not just our country. Uh, there was just an article about China that is struggling with that as well. So, and you can just imagine with the size of China, what kind of size of the population is. 
Wow. Yeah. And I, well, I think you can, you can plot the number of McDonald's and obesity. <laughs> I've seen some of these crazy charts and, uh, but that's not all true. You know, I actually went to Sweden one time. There are more McDonald's. I mean, like everywhere you look, there's a McDonald's and they're all a bunch of skinny, good looking people. So maybe it's not, I don't want to blame it all on fast food and drugs, but, but I happen to, I do happen to think that it might be something that's, that's happening from a nutritional standpoint and the prevalence of seafood, but it's definitely a real thing. And I personally have struggled with it myself. Um, I'm down about, about 60 pounds from my peak and it is not easy. And I'd still have a lot more to go to get back down into that healthy weight category. And if I, you know, if I just go off, I'll eat the way I want just for a few days, man, I see it immediately on the scale and I feel it going to go another notch on the belt. It's, it's a, it's a real challenge. Well, what's become increasingly apparent is that there's a very, very strong genetic component to it. And as we're learning more and more about the appetite center in the brain, which is in the hypothalamus, we, we're learning about pathways, new pathways every year. That's why this is such an exciting area. Uh, you know, if you have a receptor, you can build a peptide for it. You know, and the, the key challenge is figuring out which ones work where and what causes the least harm to other parts of the body. So let's let's transition into talking about, you know, those peptides. And first of all, I mean, the, we all know what I think everybody knows. What, what are the, the ways to help uh, uh, lose weight? And that is exercise more and eat less. That's the secret, right? So we're all done, everybody. But no, what, what other choices do people have? Well, there's we in obesity medicine, we talk about the four pillars, diet and exercise that you've already mentioned, behavioral treatments, and medications. Those are the four pillars. And it's the consensus is among obesity medicine doctors is that you probably need support of all four, you know, just like a stool, uh, to, to be successful in the long run. So um, I, I know that there's other medicines, in fact, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, people take chemotherapy and they lose weight. I mean, that's a harsh way to try and lose weight. But there's also, um, you know, surgeries. Have, there's like I hear like lap band and bariatric. What are those? They're all just different uh, types of surgery for obesity with varying degrees of success. Lap bands have gone out of favor because they weren't very successful. One thing we have found is that anybody can cheat any kind of surgery. There's always ways around it. You know, for example, with the lap bands, basically what the lap band is, is a constricting area in the upper stomach so that it, it uh, restricts the amount of eating you can do one setting. So people, if they have the strong enough desire, can have a milkshake and easily consume more calories uh, than what they should. So. Uh, while the obesity surgery is the most successful in terms of the extent of weight loss, there's still a great challenge. And I have many patients who've had the surgery who are now on GLP-1 agents because, uh, you know, five years afterwards, they regain their weight. So we're, let's, let's start peeling the onion here and get down into the, so the GLP-1 inhibitors how, how do they, do we know how they work? What, what are they, I guess? And, and can you describe them? Well, these, all of these peptides are described by reference to the receptors that they act, that they activate. Okay. So GLP is glucagon like peptide, which activates the GLP receptor. Now you have GLP receptors all over your body. But specifically for weight loss, the one that's the biggest focus is receptors in the hypothalamus that, that have to do with lowering appetite. And all the receptors we talk about, for the most part, are located in that area. And it's just different areas to activate to be able to get a more effective uh, weight loss. So there, there's several different GLP-1 inhibitors that are in the market. And I mean, I've heard the brand names of Wegovy. Ozempic is the one that gets, that probably gets, if you ask anybody, this one everybody knows, but there's Monjaro and Zepbound. Are, are these all, are those the major ones? Or, and what, what maybe what's the yeah. chemistry, but how, how are they similar? How are they different? So to simplify things, <clears throat> there really is only two separate kinds of GLP-1 agonists that are FDA approved for weight loss this time. 
uh, and they belong to the semaglutide family and the terzepatide family. Both Ozempic and Wegovy are semaglutide. The only difference between them is one is being used for diabetes and the other is being used for weight loss, or at mm -hmm. least that's their approved uh, use. For the terzepatide, the other agent, the other two uh, medications you mentioned, the Manjaro and Zepbound, are respectively for diabetes and weight loss. Uh, and, and But it's the same underlying medication. Is, is it the application that's different? Is it different dosages or different frequencies? So for semaglutide, it is a different dosage. Uh, the, the levels uh, and the amount of medication you need to take is generally less for glucose control as opposed to weight loss. Okay. But it's the same exact medication. And um, and how are these administered? It's, I, know, I, I know the answer, but I, I want, you know, well, there, I'm sure there's sure. lots of people out there who don't know. So that's an evolution, but the ones that we're discussing now that are FDA approved uh, for weight loss, they're all injections. They're all once weekly injections. That's uh, what we call a sub Q injection in the fat of the arm, the thighs or the belly. And I've seen pictures of these. So they come like one, one syringe that's pre-measured and somebody, the patient takes the cap off and just kind of stabs it in the belly. Is that the deal? Yeah, it's it, they're they're technically they're pens. They're called pens, and they're okay. basically apl applicators for self administration. And you can titrate the dosage, uh, you know, either based on a dial or a separate pen sometimes. But that's how they all come to make it to allow for ease of use for patients. So are there are there pill? I know I've seen research. I guess there are pill forms out there, but they're not as effective, right? Not as effective. They're still in their infancy. That's the holy grail right now because, and, and we don't know the true answer to this, but it's remarkably e easy. And you wouldn't think that at first hearing about it, but most patients do not have a trouble with injecting themselves. Uh, you know, it's a very small needle. Uh, that's how diabetics have been injecting themselves for decades with insulin. So it's sure. a similar type of syringe, you know, when, you, when you're when using the syringe method and the, uh, the pen applicator, applicator is even easier. But so, the oral agents are now being studied because uh, the thought is that they are going to be much more palatable to people. We didn't get this out in the front, but we'll make sure we reiterate this right now that nothing we're saying here is any sort of advice from a medical standpoint or an investment standpoint. Um, you know, you speak seek your own advice from your own professional. Ari's given his own opinion here. So, uh, but so the next question I had is about side effects. So what, what are the, uh, hopefully weight loss is one of the effects, but <laughs> what, what other sort of side effects um, do people get? So the primary ones are all GI tract related, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. That's why when we start patients on these medications, we do a careful titration. We start at a lower dose and then gradually work our way up, titrating to the degree of appetite control okay. and ensuring that patients don't go up in dose if they're still ill from side effects. Okay. Some of the stuff that I read was that in each one of those elevations, there's usually a new onset of side effects. Um, what what sort of percentage of people do you you know do you see in your patient? Maybe uh, people like what well, what. What's the likelihood somebody's going to get nausea or diarrhea? I mean, that's what, what would you expect? So probably over this, we know from the randomized trials that at least 50% get one of the above or more. Okay. Uh, most of the side effects we see are usually on initiation. Yes, we can see it when we get to dose elevation, but if it's, if it's timed out properly, essentially patients don't go up in dose quicker than once a month. Okay. So, like Go ahead. Yeah. Let me clarify something. It's not the fact that this makes you feel sick that it works, is it? Correct. Because this is this is central in the brain. The GI effects are related to receptors in the GI tract. Okay. That's interesting. So what's the connection that makes you feel nauseous? Is it is it changing something in your hypothalamus and that's what makes you feel nauseous? Or No, well, part of what this medication does, this class of medication, is it slows down digestion. 
Okay. And so there's thought that that is, you know, basically food is being retained in the st in the stomach longer, and the stomach uh, senses that you are full when you're not actually full. Okay. But the predominant mechanism, the mechanism of the weight loss, is central in the brain. Okay. And what sort of results do people see? So that's what has led to you know, the success of this group of medications. So in general, we have other medications that are used and have been used for weight loss, some of them controversial. We have one called Contra, we have one called Qsimia. They belong to different categories of medication. The general truism is this, um, the GLP-1 agonists are the first ever weight loss medications that are able to give patients on average double digit percentage weight loss at one year. So you're, in one year, words, you're talking 10, 15, 20%? Correct. And the, the others that had preceded or that are still used is generally less, less than 10%. So that, that's, that was a remarkable step forward. And the uh, diet dieting industry has had its own stumbling. You know, we had Fen Fen back in the 90s. You know, I ended up operating on several of the patients because they developed heart complications from it. Um, the one thing that's really nice about this GLP-1 agonist that not too many people are aware of, but the first ones that were used for were 20 years ago. They've been around. It's different, different specific drugs, but they are GLP-1 agonists, and they have similar side effect profiles. And they were so being we, used go ahead. For, for, I'm sorry, they were being used for diabetes then probably, right? Correct, for diabetes. That was the entrance for all these medications. Uh, the discovery that patients on the semaglutide, in other words, the ozempic, that they were losing weight was serendipitous. No one had any idea. And so that's what then led to the explosion that you see, you know, Novo Nordisk, when they saw all these patients losing weight on the semaglutide, decided to conduct a study about weight loss. And they found that at one year, the average weight loss was 15% of starting weight, wow. which is big. And, uh, and, and terzepatide, you know, Eli Lilly, that makes the terzepatide formulations was late to the show. Novo was there first, mm -hmm. and then Lily stepped in and remarkably caught up and now looks like they're even surpassing in terms of the efficacy of the medications. Wow. So these are, um, let's be clear, this isn't a, you know, take a shot once and you're done. This is a, is it a, it's a weekly shot? Is that I understand? Yeah, yeah. it's a weekly, weekly injection uh, at this stage of the game. So the way that, you know, for GLP, that the group of hormones that are GLP agonists in the body lasts very short time, seconds to minutes. These medications are like the GLP, but they've been modified so they last for a week. That's why it's a once a week injection. So, uh, and it's uh, once a week for a month or two or a year. <laughs> Well, the, you know, as I tell all my patients, this is, this medication is meant to be a lifetime medication. The history with patients who stopped the medication isn't very good. Um, in the original studies, uh, at the end of each study, the medications were stopped, whether or not the patient wanted that. And uh, they followed the patients after the study was over and conducted a follow-up study and found that on average, uh, almost all the patients regained two thirds of the weight. It was in so my local was paper. Simple. It was in my local paper. Women stops taking Ozempic gains thirty pounds. There was a yeah. was in the local paper just a couple of weeks ago. There, there are exceptions, of course, you know, but it's a struggle. You know, having uh, lost weight without the benefit of medications, you know, it's a struggle. So people, people have a lot of difficulty. So the general consensus is, and the Achilles heel of this therapy is that you need to stay on it for life. And the, the other part of the Achilles heel that's complicating matters is nobody's gonna pay for it in terms of insurers and Medicare. So it puts patients in a difficult position. So are, are there, so we don't know about long-term side effects, do we? I mean, it, 
We do. We do. Because remember, diabetics have been oh. on this medication for, for years. Decades. Same. Okay. So, so the idea is, uh, so there's a black label warning that the FDA requires because at least for semaglutide, and it's felt to be common to all GLP-1 agonists, may be a risk of thyroid cancer. However, we did not see that borne out in the trials. We okay. tell patients there's a risk for thyroid cancer, and certainly patients that have had thyroid cancer can't go on the medication. The other one long-term is pancreatitis and cholecystitis or gallbladder disease. That can happen. It's relatively rare, but it does happen. So, that, I mean, there's probably, I mean, some pros and cons things to me as like certainly carrying around extra weight has all these other side effects, the heart and the diabetes, and, and those are all certainly not good things. Um, I, I have a very controversial theory about smoking, and that is that if you, um, you know, talk to certain medical professionals, they'll say one of the best things you can do in your life uh, to pro prolong your life is to minimize stress. And one of the best things you can do if you have a stressful job is every hour, get up, go for a walk and take deep breaths. So I said, that sounds a lot like smoking. <laughs> you know, I used to work for a company <laughs> and I had a stressful job and the smokers got to get up once an hour and go outside and smoke cigarettes. And I got in the habit of going with them. Not that I did cigarettes, but being able to get up and walk around there, there was, and I had this, this theory that more smokers would die if it didn't actually, and maybe the nicotine does have some benefits there. I'm <laughs> not advocating anybody smoke, but I'm just saying that there are, sounds like there's some risks here. And, and it's, this it sounds pretty compelling um, that uh, you know, that you're going to be healthier, look healthier, feel healthier, and, and really actually be healthier so maybe it's worth a little bit of the risk with the nausea and the nausea and the um and the gastric stuff they don't stick around that's that goes away after a while right well with with most patients yes so basically typically when i when i speak to my patients uh, i i let them know that if you have any of these side effects they don't go away or they're getting worse and certainly if you're throwing up every day or having multiple bouts of diarrhea every day to stop the medication it's okay. not for them uh, and that's very idiosyncratic. We have no way of figuring out who's going to get that in advance. Uh, but that, and in the clinical studies, five to ten percent of patients at some point in the study dropped out because of the side effects. Okay. So let's. You've prescribed this for quite a while. Uh, do you have any success stories to share? Do you? I mean, did any anecdotes come to mind? Yeah, I mean, there, there's tons of success stories. The key challenge is always getting the patient on the right dosage of the medication. So for some of glutide, we expect 15%, but as with anything, and this is one of your areas for a forte, is it's a bell curve, right? And so yeah. the average weight loss, if it's 15%, you have there's a wide variance. And I've had patients on the semaglutide, which is an average of 15%, who've lost 25% or more. And the terzepatide, similarly, uh, it's all over. But we also have patients at the other end that even going to the higher doses are relatively resistant. So that's th that's why this is a sort of trial uh, by error. You know, who, who, who can we get to a good enough dose that they're successful? Uh, that's, that, that's the challenge. But uh, typically, uh, most patients respond and respond very well. They start losing weight right away. What about any of these unofficial impacts that you and I have talked about? And I've read that people lose, they stop other compulsive behaviors like smoking, like drinking, and even gambling. I, I mean, I've read in a report, I think it was Bank of America a while back has talked about this um, sort of GLP-1 antagonist cohort of stocks because adoption of these medicines could have huge impacts on, you know, people are going to eat less snacks. That's obvious, but maybe people, do people stop? Do you see this, the stuff I'm talking about here? Yeah, they the patients frequently express the other things that have gotten better. Most of the time it's alcohol, desire for alcohol. And these are not alcoholics, just uh, you know, if their routine was to have two glasses of wine each day with dinner, they, they're actually very neutral and see no benefit to it. It changes your relationship with not only food and alcohol, but 
we're just doing the studies now, so we don't have anything definitive. But uh, for a lot of other uh, so-called addictions, gambling, smoking, drinking, uh, that they may have some common pe pleasure pathway in the brain that the GLP-1 agonists affect. And then the question becomes, uh, if you stop the medication, do they recur? And I suspect they do. Hmm. But uh, all of those, the, the GLP-1 uh, agonists are, are very interesting. Very interesting that, you know, we keep finding, ex you know, extended uh, potential benefits, but studies are in their infancy. You know, these we have retrospective studies that are never taken as gold, but uh, kidneys may improve. We know from a, a study published last year uh, on semaglutide that in patients with known cardiovascular disease, they decrease their mortality and morbidity from the uh, heart and from the brain uh, by 20%. And the even more fascinating part is it, you, you would guess, right? Oh, it's just the weight loss. They got the weight loss. Those things got better. But those effects came before even the weight loss. Patients lost, you know, maybe within the first month or two, they were already at considerably lower risk when they really hadn't lost much, much weight. And uh, that's a very, very provocative phenomenon, because what that means is there's other effects of this medication, and how are they translating to improved outcomes? One, one thought is anti-inflammatory. Many disease states in human beings and other animals are, are due to excessive inflammation. Sure. And so that's, that, that is now one of the hypotheses that's being investigated. But you can just imagine both Lilly and Novo Nordisk have numerous studies. You can go on the on the websites to see how many are being conducted for all those conditions you mentioned. Hmm. Because if there's proof in a randomized trial that it's effective, that makes the argument to getting the medication covered by Medicare insurance even more compelling. And that that's a huge point to talk about well, that there. And I was, that's kind of where I wanted to ask a question about that it has to do with, with cost. I mean, I know that I, I was just reading a week or so ago, uh, a recent, um, a recent study by payroll.org said that 78% of uh, Americans are living paycheck to paycheck right now. Um, and, you know, if this medication is not covered by insurance, I mean, it's, what seven eight hundred bucks a month? I don't know the the cost of Ozempic without insurance, but I know I I I, I read it's very expensive. I, I I'm trying to translate all of this data, and I love learning this. By the way, I think this is this is fascinating. Um, how is this going to translate into a trade for me? Um, <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> maybe I'm well, jumping the. But, maybe I'm but, jumping but the I gun. do. Talk yeah, about the Greg, cost, Ari, and then we'll talk about insurance. Yeah, so Greg, that's a, you brought up a very interesting topic. You know, in medicine, uh, and we see this more in areas of socialized medicine, but we have a thing called cost per quality adjusted life, life year, per cost per quality. What that is, is how much is this treatment you're introducing going to cost us per, per year of life saved, essentially? And so the usual cutoff about whether a medication is accepted to be covered by insurance and Medicare is if the cost per quality adjusted life year is less than 100000 per year. That's, that's the cutoff. And that's what Great Britain does. Great Britain has somewhere between 50 and 100. And we don't have to get into the weeds about this. But right, but basically, it, you're, you're, you're calculating, and I, it's not an easy calculation, is the societal benefit. Uh, if, uh, if someone loses weight over such period of time, uh, are all their morbidities downstream improved? And it's very complicated. In, in other, you know, one important fact that people don't think about is let's say an, a workplace insurance decides to cover it. You know, people would try to convince them and say, hey, look, you're saving all this money on the downstream heart disease. Well, that's not necessarily true because when the patients get older, they go on Medicare. 
for the most part. So the burden is now being put on the workplace where the benefit may accrue uh, uh, to the to Medicare and the government later on. So it's it's right. really uh, very nuanced. But in terms of the actual costs, so generally speaking for both medications, it's generally if you have to pay full price for the brand name product, it is between thousand and fifteen hundred a month. That's the the average, uh, and that is of course what led to the proliferation of this compounding that I'm sure we're going to get into at some point. Yeah, that's a big deal. So that's you know you saw in the notes that I sent you, I talked about this all in cost, and that is that if you what's the cost of the the drug less groceries, less other medications. I mean, I've heard people say that they've stopped taking six other medications because uh, because they're losing weight and all these other effects. And then, you know, less doctor's visits. And, you know, you mentioned the heart disease. I didn't even think about that because that doesn't, you know, benefit the workplace insurer. That benefits uh, Medicare down the road. Um, so how does, how does, how do the insurers look at this? I mean, that's, where do you see that heading? So and, and bring in so bring in like you know your your United Healthcare and your Blue Cross Blue Shields, but what do you think about Medicare? So, yeah, in general, if we're going to make generalizations, insurers balk at covering something that Medicare refused to recognize, and Medicare, uh, by law, a law passed in the early two thousands. It is against the law for Medicare to cover weight loss medication. All right. So none of the elderly in that category can get that paid for currently. Um, and so the insurers will point to Medicare. And of course, the insurers, and they're having difficulty now, right? We have, we're getting all this information about the medical loss ratios being so high uh, with the managed care that many of the health insurers are seeing their profits go down. So it becomes really, the interplay is very complex. And in the American system, which is overly complicated, we even have benefit managers that negotiate the pricing of insurance and, and they take a cut. So it's a morass. It's a morass, makes it very difficult. Uh, the only places I think that are going to get, uh, let's say it's a workplace, uh, if a workplace is convinced that their employees will benefit from this, if they have enough market power, they can tell the insurer that they have to cover it, you know, and, and uh, but that's few and far between, right? These big conglomerates that have that kind of market power. So it's very convoluted. The trend right now is that more and more insurers who initially covered the medication at the turn of this year going to, to 2024, drop the coverage for weight loss. Hmm. Okay. So let's look a little bit more at the, well, one other thing, and that is you mentioned some of these other studies that are out there. I've heard sleep apnea. Uh, in fact, I got called for a sleep apnea study and I was like, I, I called them, but I said, you're, you know, we want you to do a medical trial overnight, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I said, well, can you tell me what the drug is? And it, it's actually a depression medication that, um, I said, well, if it's a GLP-1 inhibitor, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> I would consider it anyways. I would consider it. So I know there's studies for sleep apnea and and then maybe maybe even osteoarthritis or something. Are those, do any of those look likely to pass and when? Uh, probably. And we, we have a lot of catalysts coming up this year for both Lilly and Novo Nordisk and all the other myriad smaller uh, entities that are trying to find the next uh, magic one. Now, we do know just recently last week, it was published and presented that patients who were, had been on the medication had lower complication rate after hip surgery, fewer hospitalizations, et cetera. And we're gonna see this kind of evidence continue to accrue. I think the inertia is on the side of showing these degenerative diseases, you know, diabetes, hypertension, all of these things are going to improve. We do have studies already from before with just weight loss alone. Hmm. So the benefits to your uh, blood pressure, your diabetes, 
they're seen as early as losing just 5% of your weight. This is without GLP. That's just what we know uh, with weight loss, that you're already seeing benefits. And I, I've got patients coming in who they started out on five meds are now down to two. You know, all those things we're seeing happening. But we do need a rigorous study because uh, that's the only thing that's going to compel insurers to, to cover it. These retrospective or small studies aren't going to cut it. So let's let's look at the business here and and who's you mentioned a couple of names you thrown out Nova Nordisk and Lilly, those are the names that certainly come to mind. Is are they are the big players, right? They're the big players that have a relatively wide moat. Okay. Uh, they have, uh, they were brilliant in their approach. And Nova Nordisk is a very interesting company. It is a, based out of Denmark. Mm -hmm. It's capitalization now, and I, we discussed this before, is bigger than the GDP of the entire country. Wow. And so much so that uh, government figures are saying that uh, Novo and Ordis saved their country from a depression. Wow. So, so it's very, uh, very interesting. That's how big this has gotten. And of course, Eli Lilly is now three quarters of a billion in, in uh, market size, and it's being discussed uh, you know, there it's the buy institutions are saying that it'll be the first trillion dollar pharma company. Trillion dollar. Uh, pharma. So they, they're now, I don't know if people have seen, but the new mag seven is Tesla's out. Eli Lilly's in because they've, they've surpassed Tesla in market capitalization. And that's um, yeah. I saw that stuff over the weekend and I know. They, five, they have, they have, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You go. You finish. So they have been incredibly perceptive and realize that this is a changing landscape. So there is a great uh, benefit of having these two oligopolies, for, for lack of a better term, pushing each other. That's when competition is greatest because they are, they are now, when one has the one in advance, right? The other is looking for the next one. So for instance, um, uh, Novo Nordisk has now a dual agent of a new combination, which is a GLP-1 with a medication called cagrolintide, and that's a completely different mechanism. Another uh, hormone, and that hormone, amylin, works on the stomach itself. So they're all trying to compete. They are aggressively going after other companies, the small bio uh, companies um, and some some of those smaller companies, their stock has gone up immensely, and are, and don't have they don't have any kind of profit yet. But there's an anticipated engulf engulf and devour by the bigger by the bigger companies. Lily and Novo Nordisk uh, are going to buy right and left to add to their uh, thing because they they're in they're in the place where they can preserve it. That's why I'm so convinced that they're the ones that are going to continue to thrive. So um, before we dive down into some of the smaller companies that, you know, when I think of pharma, the, the name Pfizer is on the front of everybody's mind, I think. Uh, where are they in this spectrum? They're hurting. Uh, they are probably going to have to buy a company if they want the medication. Everything that they have developing uh, had an incredibly high dropout rate for side effects. Okay. So they can't bring something like that to market, you know, uh, and so they they were caught with their pants down. And of course, their market cap has suffered in addition to suffering because of the COVID vaccine uh, decrement. So Pfizer, I'm sure, is going to buy somebody at some point uh, because that that effort more or less failed. So one of our viewers and uh, somebody you've seen around, Ken Cameron, sent in a question and said, hey, ask, ask Dr. Ari about Viking ther uh, Therapeutics, the VK2735 and use as a pill. Any, any, do you have any knowledge of that? Yeah, it's still very early. VKTX is one of those companies that have uh, really flourished. Their market cap went up phenomenally. Um, just on preliminary studies that are in phase one, so uh, I have, if I had to predict a company that's going to get bought out, that's the v VKTX Viking Therapeutics is probably the one because uh, they they are 
it's amazing how f favored it is in the market right now. But uh, uh, they are they are, they do have an agent. The agent is a different kind of dual agent with a different medication in it. So uh, everybody's trying to do these combo things, and some of them are working together with Novo Nordisk or Lilly to use their medication in combination with one of theirs. Uh, the other thing that's being actively investigated is one of the things that we've learned about weight loss, especially when it occurs rapidly, is the loss of muscle tissue. Right. Uh, I heard that as a side effect. Yeah. 30 to 40% of weight loss can be muscle. And so, and especially, especially in older women. So, and, and when you lose muscle, you're prone to a lot of other things like fractures, hip fractures, that kind of thing. So a lot of effort is being put into uh, preserving the muscle and having a combination with the GLP-1. And we do have some preliminary data on these muscle building medications because they're used in cancer patients who have lost a tremendous amount of weight. So it, we're really on the precipice of, of uh, remarkable changes depending on what comes to be borne out in the clinical studies. So. Long roundabout way, VKTX is only doing their second phase studies right now that they started mid last year. Uh, they may have their results by the end of this year, but then they still have a phase three to go. Okay. The, the, the issue with trying to bring a phase two drug to market is unless the FDA grants an early review, and that's very selective, since patients have other possibilities, i.e., uh, semaglutide terzepatide, they're going to have to go through the uh, a third the third phase trial. So it's years away for them. Oh, okay. Well, next time when you give me a tip, um, make sure you, <laughs> you hit me hard because you you told me about VK before they went up, and then you said, yeah, you said you you're mentioning them as somebody to keep an eye on. I said, oh yeah, okay. And uh, by the so the stock was like fifteen dollars, and now it's like thirty five. Uh, and this is just over the past few days or past few weeks, uh, pretty significant move up on that stock. So uh, give, give me more of those. <laughs> just, well, yeah. there, there are quite a few that are really looking promising, you know, and they're they're on the pipeline. Altimune has done very well and is developing a product. Catalent, the company that uh, Novo Nordisk bought, you know, they, they have these things called CDMOs that people who are not familiar with the pharma process is that many of these companies, if they make the semaglutide or terzepatide, they outsource the final production to these, uh, I forget the acronym uh, of, of what they are, CDMOs, I believe it is. It's Contract Delivery Manufacturing Organization. CTLT was one of them because uh, Novo Nordisk was finding that it couldn't put out enough. And that was one of the reasons. That's why they bought out the company or are trying to buy out the company. Yeah, so Catalan being acquired. Yeah. And they and they shot up as well. Right. Uh, you know, well, that, there's... Go ahead, I'm sorry. So that brings up the point. You know, you're talking about these, um, the manufacturing and the bottlenecking. Uh, let's So semaglutide and terzepatide, terzepatide are currently on the FDA shortage list. Is that the right vernacular there? Is that, what does that mean? Yes. Yeah, and anybody can access this at FDA.org, uh, but the they keep it continually updated. And the way this works is that uh, it, it just can't be any medication that's in shortage. It has to be a medication that is medically necessary for public health. And I'll give you an example, back during COVID, when many medications were being run out of the hospitals, right? the hospitals contracted with compounding pharmacies to supply the medication. So, and these are pharmacies that essentially are making copies of the medication. The only time you can ever violate, uh, I'm not an attorney, but I believe the only time you can violate a patent on a, on a drug is if the FDA declares it officially in shortage and uh, declares that the medication is necessary for the public health. The FDA has done that for all four of the drugs that we've mentioned. Wow, and it, and it's it's a real bottleneck. That's that's the biggest issue. And but you can only build factories so fast, right? So they're all actively acquiring factories and building in the states and outside of the country. 
So can you explain the role of a compounding pharmacy and how it pertains to GLP-1 inhibitors? Sure. So they, as you are probably aware, have flourished in, in the current environment because what better recipe do you have than uh, medications that are highly effective for a condition that's extremely prevalent, that costs way too much for most patients, and that are in shortage? So compounding pharmacies are the pharmacies that make essentially the copies of these medications or reasonable facsimiles. Uh, and they make the medication and supply it to patients. They operate outside of the supply chain of Lilly and Novo Nordisk. So they're able to access the medication, mix it up in solution. One of the main differences, there's a couple of differences. So brand the brand name medications are FDA approved. Right. Compounded medications are never FDA approved because the FDA does not have an opportunity to examine the product. Uh, and so um, what it's done is because all the money in this, uh, entrepreneurs have been opening clinics right and left, and some opened online ordering. And right. this this is what created, it, it, it gives a great name and a very bad name to these compounding pharmacies, because as with any enterprise, there are those that are legitimate and those that uh, function illegally. You know, with and so though that's the big challenge. You know, patients, um, the vast majority of patients that I see in my clinics are coming for compounded medication because they can't afford uh, the brand name medication and their insurance won't cover it. A substantial portion do have coverage. They only have a twenty-five dollar copay for Ozempic, but they, I have one today that I saw that waited nine months and finally gave up on getting the Wagobi. So they came to our clinic to get the compound diversion. So how does that, I mean, that's just, uh, that's just fascinating to me. And you and I have talked about this and anybody listening here could with a Google search within five minutes can be at a point where you're entering your credit card and getting the stuff shipped to you. And you mentioned that's probably illegal. And I would think not something you want to be getting some compound for some of these websites are pretty damn sketchy. And you see like there's TikTok videos of people showing how to do the injections and, uh, and, you know, click on this link and give your credit card and you're going to get some stuff in the mail and get some syringes and take the stuff and put it in your body scares the daylights out of me probably and you mentioned there's given a bad name for compounding pharmacies but but there are definitely good ones and bad ones out there but so what sort of cost savings are people seeing how does how does that affect the market what, what so a whole so, bunch of questions here yeah so interestingly I, I there's tons of patients because each you can probably look up in the city that you live in and look up to see glp1 uh you know agents and they're they're cropping up everywhere. The problem is some of these entrepreneurs have no idea of how to run a medical business. And so it becomes some uh, border on being unethical and some just completely cross the line. For example, uh, a patient should never uh, get a prescription online without speaking to a physician and who writes the prescription because you don't know what you're getting. Um, in, in England, they had in one day, 20 patients going to the emergency room because they thought they were taking semaglutide, but it was then found that they were injecting themselves with insulin. Right. I heard about that. You yeah. know? So these, these, they, they, there's a lot of bad stuff going on and they need to be prosecuted. And they are. And Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly are also going after them through civil law. Uh, because they're putting on their websites, uh, get Ozempe, get Wagobi. Well, they can't use the marketing name oh, from okay. uh, Eli Lilly's or Novo Nordisk. And uh, a case was just decided in court this past week uh, for two clinics that were falsely advertising. So giving the impression, right? It doesn't have to be that they do it intentionally. If it gives the impression to the patient that they're getting the same thing as Ozempic, uh, or Wagovi or Manjaro, then that is often enough for them to be in trouble. It's the semaglutide and um, trisepatide are right. not patented, though. They're available. You know, you get the right license. Anybody can go buy as much as they want. 
what is the patent is around the application, right? So it depends who you ask. And that's okay. that's the big controversy. Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk claim that they have patents on the actual medication. And so, uh, but I mean, if you can look patents up, there, there's like 10 patents for each of those because they go and file for everything, right? If you want to have a business that you want to protect, you know, so it's, it goes beyond just the pen application. That's a rumor that's been going on. Oh, okay. But, uh, but so the, we know that these compounding pharmacies are getting terzepatide because anytime a pharmacy is shipped a, medic, a medication, the medication has to come with a certificate showing that the manufacturer sending it to the compounding clinic uh, tested the ingredients and it shows that the ingredients were such and such. Okay. So uh, uh, as just one more thing on this topic is that, uh, for instance, uh, semaglutide base, the chemical formulation of a base was the medication that was approved. Pharmacies were getting the semaglutide salt and that's what they were selling to patients without letting them know. And the FDA ca came out and said, we haven't even approved the salt version to be used in humans at all. Oh. So this is all the complexity of what's going on uh, with so many things thrown into the mix. So you you mentioned to me before that analysts are missing the point. Is it is it around this topic that as far as understanding what the market size is, is this, this is... Partially, I think, so remember, uh, both for both Rigovi and I would have both, both for Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly, they're severely constrained by the supply they have. So they can't get it out to market fast enough. Everything they get out, patients are getting, uh, mostly insured patients or wealthy patients. However, the vast majority of patients are not able to get it. Uh, and so they come to these compounding clinics. Now we have no way of measuring how many patients are doing that, but I would bet, I bet a million dollars that it's over a million patients a year. You know, I think that it's very high. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they go in, they get evaluated. If there's no contraindications, they go on the medication. They come to the clinic every month to pick up their medication to get weighed in uh, and they're followed, you know? And so right now, on compounded medications, I'm following 4,000 patients. Wow. You know, so just imagine, that's just me, you know? So I think it's a whole lot bigger. The The analysts have no idea what to look for. There's no database saying uh, this compounding pharmacy is selling X number per year. So it's an unknown, but they're missing it. They're missing it. Uh, they're, they're basically, their estimates of the... Uh, what the cash flow will be are based on the fact that there's a shortage right now and it's going to get unleashed as soon as Lilly and Novo Nordis catch up. But I think it's going to be not just unleashing from just having supply available, but also um, what's going to end up happening is at some point when the supply is available, the FDA is going to remove the shortage classification. When they do that, it essentially will not be legal for the compounding pharmacies to mix this medication anymore because that would violate the patent. Mm. So that's where I think that they're missing the boat. I think that the uh, if we think that a lot of people are using it now, just wait until the supply meets demand and even better, just wait. If Medicare, there's a bill in Congress right now to try to get Medicare to cover the weight loss medications. I don't know how successful it is, but uh, you, as you might imagine, millions of, are being spent by the man, you know, Novo Nordisk and Lilly to lobby for that. So I guess you're well, watching said, both both of these things uh, to get an idea if the FDA takes it off of that um, restricted list. Uh, and then, of course, we'll, we'll see what happens in Congress with Medicare. Uh, certainly, this is, I mean, I, I think the winners there are going to be Lilly and Nova Nordisk, or is there some other winners do you see? 
Yeah, unless somebody comes up with something dramatically different. Remember, so both the competition between Lilly and Novo Nordisk has already uh, offered medications that are better than the current crop that's been approved, or at least seemingly so. Uh, Novo Nordisk is, is, has a combination agent that looks like it's going to have results comparable to that with Eli Lilly's medications. Eli Lilly has outdone itself. It's not the phase three trial isn't completed, but reditrutide is a medication that's a triple agonist, you know? So uh, they, they are revving up. I don't see how any small company or large, you know, any of these big names, they're trying. Now they're going to buy, you know, they're going to keep buying other companies to try to bring that in-house, but they've got a lot of catching up to do. And the measure by which they're judged are the results from uh, Eli Lilly more than anything else. I've seen some pretty crazy potential valuations for Eli Lilly. And like, we could be halfway there um, and still look at the chart. If you look at the charts, it's a jaw dropper because it looks like, it looks like an NVIDIA sort of sort of thing. In fact, there's been comparisons between the two. Um, I, I just, I wonder how much of this is priced in or like, I don't know. It's uh, certainly something to keep an eye on. Yeah, we, we, we don't know, but I think a lot of the confidence is the pipeline, Yeah, the pipeline. And remember, Eli Lilly also has a medication for Alzheimer's that had better results to the than the only existing one. So they're awaiting FDA approval, which is supposed to come sometime early this year. And that's a huge market too. So Lily has other uh, things going besides the weight loss, whereas Novo Nordisk is not a one-trick pony, but it's very focused on this me metabolic area, diabetes, uh, obesity, et cetera. I heard you can't get um, you can't get the Ozempic in Denmark. Is that true? I don't think that's true. Now their their approval process is a little bit different. I know that some countries they can't patients can't be put on it for weight loss. That the countries have restricted the use to only diabetics. Oh, okay. And that maybe, was, maybe it was for weight loss. Yeah, I think that was the the quote that I heard, which was, "Well, did you watch the Callie Means interview with Tucker Carlson?" I did not get a chance, but I'm happy yeah, probably, to talk about anything you uh, want to bring up. Well. <laughs> Oh, well, he said doctors who prescribe Mojano are paid by Eli Lilly. So, I, so I are you get, you do you get a check from Eli Lilly or Nova Nordisk? No, 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 I don't. I don't get a check from anybody. <laughs> but the but um, that would be highly illegal. Now, are they getting gifts or other things going on? Are they going to conferences? Sure, but the beauty of that is that's all public access informa information because of a. Uh, a law passed by Congress a few years for transparency. Any company that gives something to a doctor of some value, and the value is actually pretty low, like a, I think a cumulative value at one year of $250, something like that, okay. they have to declare it with the doctor's name on a public forum. I might have taken it out of context. And maybe he was talking about doctors who are doing research. And re people who are doing research get grants. And I mean, that's not... This, I mean, it works out to be somebody's salary and eventually maybe that's what they were talking about. Um, I, I don't know. Um, it just seemed to imply that there was some, some shady unethical business here, but I'm, but I'm not, I'm not seeing that. And he also brought up the fact that the NAACP is a lobbying agents, registered lobby lobbyists for Eli Lilly and, you know, thinking about that, if you looked at go back, circling back to the obesity numbers, certainly the black demographic has, I, I think obesity is close to 50% there. And I don't, I mean, I don't see anything wrong with you lobbying for your demographic. If these drugs work, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but there's some sort of implication that maybe this would be bad, I guess. I'm not a hundred percent sure where he's coming from, but what, I mean, what's, what are the concerns? What are the negative? I mean, what is, what's the counter argument to why these are bad? Well, I mean, the lobbyists exist for every company that's a sizable country, right? Uh, company, because that's how laws in Congress get passed. It's uh, you know, what do they say? Sausage making, Oof. but they, they um, you know, look, uh, it's a smart move, if you ask me. I don't know much about the details, 
but minorities are underserved because uh, on, on a, uh, in terms of the white population, Hispanic, black population, there is much more poverty in the latter two than there is in the first one. And so their access to medications is low and they would never be able to pay out of pocket for a medication. So that's why they're lobbying hard primarily for Medicare and Medicaid, but also to get Congress to remember, we have the ACA, Obamacare. They can pass other laws to require insurance companies to cover the medication. And for an example, if the law, the Medicare law passes and Medicare is required to cover, then by definition and by law, every exchange in every state has to follow that. Wow. That's that's part of the ACA. So you could see there's a lot of implications. But listen, if there are vulnerable patients involved, that's going to be much more likely to get to grasp attention than other things. So I think it's a smart move on their part. But uh, all of that goes on. They're they're lobbying like crazy right now. So let me ask you a personal question. Do you have personal experience with this? I do. And that's part of the reason why I'm such a big proponent. Uh, I'm still on the medication. I was on the medication starting about 10 months ago. And uh, I I was so impressed. Uh, I, lo- I lost 75 pounds in that period of time. Holy crap. And, wow. and, uh, and I won't say that it was effortless. The important thing that we keep pointing out is you've got to go with all the pillars. Uh, the medication is not going to do it by himself. So I see patients all the time who come back to me and are wondering why they're not losing weight. Well, they're eating whatever they want and they're not exercising. You can't do it on its own. It'll start you. You'll start the medication and it'll be almost effortless. Upon first exposure, you almost don't want to eat anything at all. Right. But that goes away fairly quickly. And you have control over what you eat. And so uh, those other components are incredibly important, especially, especially because your brain fights you when you're losing weight. Your brain evolved during prehistoric times when nobody was overweight. It feels that way. Yeah. Well, nobody, it's true. Nobody was overweight. People were not getting enough food. Right. So there's mechanisms in the body for the brain to know how much fat you're losing because leptin, a hormone secreted by fat, tells you the, the baseline fat in the body. And so when the brain detects that you're losing fat, it doesn't know whether you're overweight, underweight. It knows that it wants to bring you back to where you are because your life is under threat right. in, in, sure. uh, it, to be anthropomorphic. So. Uh, that it sets that emotion. The brain secretes a hormone called ghrelin, and right. ghrelin fights the GLP. Right. That's why patients often have to go up on dose. And finally, the hormone also lowers metabolism, so it's harder and harder for you to lose weight to con- you know by consuming by using up the calories. And that's why patients have to exercise. It's one of the few ways where you can keep the metabolism sh- machinery going. Well, I'll tell you what, if gaining weight was a sport, I, I'd be a champion because I, I can gain weight easy. It's <laughs> like, but I, it, all this makes sense. You know, I feel it like I'm doing well and it just, it just feels like my body's where my brain's working against me. It's like, feed me, feed me. And it's, you know, the fact that we've evolved as a species over a species of hundred thousand years. And, um, you know, the healthy thing was to put on weight so we could survive the lean times. But I look at, I mean, just through even through modern history, just you know, looking back fifty years ago, I mean, within ten minutes of my house, I can get any freaking food I want. It doesn't matter what part of the globe it came from. I mean, I want fresh pineapples. I think like what do people who grew up in you know the in New England probably never saw a pineapple in there. Probably saw pictures of pineapples. Um, never mind three hundred sixty five days a year, you can go get a fresh pineapple at the store any anytime you want. Um, it's just amazing what we have at our disposal. And it's amazing that obesity is, is a problem. And it's like that, that uh, we have too much food that we're not starving. I mean, it's very fortunate um, to be that way, I guess, but it comes with some poor side effects. To, um, well, I appreciate your time here. Um, are there any other, we talked a lot about it, other stuff. Are there, is there anything in the future that we didn't talk about that you're excited about? 
Uh, not beyond what we've already spoken about, but there are a lot of avenues being explored, different lines of, of hormones and peptides that may contribute. Really, the dream will be someday to have a, a, a one-shot, maybe gene-altering therapy, <laughs> like we have now, uh, you know, these, these companies that are coming out with these... Uh, medications that you take once in your life and and try to eliminate uh, sickle cell, for instance. That's when we're going to get to the point when we, number one, understand the entire pathway, which is still only completely uh, incompletely understood, and develop effective treatments that can alter that pathway permanently. We don't have that now. You know, the, it's dependent on people continuing the medication. So there's I think for people who are watching, they're, you know, wondering a couple of different things. And one is, you know, we talked about companies and how to invest and certainly keep an eye on Lily and Novo Nordisk, so LLY and NVO, certainly names to keep an eye on. And we talked about Viking Pharmaceutical. Were there any other names in the cohort that you thought were interested in looking at? Uh, tons. And if you want, when your video comes out i'll put it in the comments i'll put a whole list i'm not recommending anything no no <laughs> but, you're, but I'm, you're, I'm, hey. I'm following i'm following 35 companies right now that okay. are in this industry that's well, great. if you email it to me i'll put it in the description how's that Perfect. We, don't have to, we don't have to go through it yeah, uh, you'll even love this i actually created an excel spreadsheet for you <laughs> i love it yeah, I love my, you know, I love my spreadsheets. Yeah, I know, I know. But so, I'll send you the spreadsheet and it contains pretty much all the latest information. Great. I already I'll... found, I already found a few trades. Viking Therapeutics has got some amazing premium in it from a trading standpoint. Yeah, that, that's a, definitely a tradable stock. Well, Ari, Ari told me about it before it exploded too. And he's like, hey, Eric, did you take, I'm like, oh, so the other, so the other group of questions that people have, what about people who are thinking this is something that they they want to explore? Some people are looking to maybe think that this might potentially add some benefit to them. How how do you suggest people explore their options for maybe seeing if GLP ones are right for them? Yeah. So the first thing that I would do is go to their primary care provider and see if the primary care provider can prescribe. Uh, the Lily, one of the Lily meds or one of the N Novo Nordisk meds and have it covered by insurance. It really varies from patient to patient. Barring that, uh, if they really want to go on the medication, because really they're beyond what we've just discussed today, everything is, is uh, the feelings, the understanding uh, and the effects are all going to come with being on the medication, you know, and, and trying it. But it's remarkable. It really is for most patients that have gone on it. Their whole relationship to food changes. Well, what I tell them is, uh, you, you know, you have any best friends from childhood, they could go with you out to the best restaurant and always seem to eat very little and be full. Well, now you're going to become like them while on this medication. Your, your satiation is changed. Most of the people, there are different types of of. Uh, reasons why people get overweight, whether it's emotional, whether it's genetic, uh, whether it's boredom. So all those triggers uh, seem to be short-circuited on this medication because I think it's a final common pathway for all of these things. Their relationship to food changes. It becomes sort of neutral. Uh, something that they love eating, like that pizza you had been discussing earlier, they'll look at it and say, eh, I don't know. And that's something that's very different for most of these patients who are struggling. So primary care physician, what if they wanted to see you? Is that like not? Uh, they can go to one of the clinics that I, I work through, uh, but uh, they don't need to see me. Just they should be careful. They should review uh, the clinic they want to see. They should, you know, telemedicine is fine. It works very well, but they should have the opportunity to talk to a doctor and have the opportunity to ask where their medications are coming through from and what part, what what kind of due diligence did the doctor do to be able to ensure that the compounded medication is of good quality and safe. Those are all things that, that need to be done, uh, but certainly don't just go online because you don't know what you get. 
Well, I really appreciate it. Greg, did you have any other, did you learn anything, Greg? No, there's been, this has been fascinating for me. Yes. I learned a ton today. I wish I, I, like I said at the beginning, I was going to sit back and listen and learn. And I've found a, I've found a new passion for a few trading vehicles, if nothing else, but I'm, yeah, I'm good. thinking that I'm thinking I have about 30 pounds I need to lose right now too. So maybe I'm uh, going to do some personal research into this also. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it's very it's has it's a uh, remarkable for being despite all we hear about the GI stuff, when we consider its predecessors, it is remarkably free of bad side effects for most people, and that's the beauty of this. This is something that you can stay on for a long time. For instance, fentermine, which is another drug, is an upper. Patients can't go to sleep at night; they have tachycardia. All of the other meds have quite a bit of a constellation of, of downside. So uh, if you can get past the GI stuff, this medication is extremely well tolerated in the long run. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for your generosity and your time, Ari. I really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm sure that all of our, this will, I think this will be one of our top 10 uh, for sure views once it gets out there and um, maybe we'll follow up. So I look forward to seeing you later on this week, Ari. Thanks again. You got it, buddy. Take care. Take care, Greg. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.